as Eric said, this is a report that's out, and it was a, it's a compilation of some of the work that we've done in this area. And I wanted to preface it with, we started this work in uh, about 2003, and so um, we're slow, that's it. Um, but we've been uh, asking some of the same questions, and so we have a lot of data that we can start comparing over the years and looking at individuals within their uh, different educational stages. And all of this started out, well, much of this, because you, you've all probably heard of Prensky and the digital natives and uh, the digital immigrants. And we felt that there were too many variables to just actually say that differences in the way we engage with technology and get information is based on age. And that's what we're finding. Age may be one variable, but it is not the determining variable. And so I guess we started out trying to refute um, Kerensky. Uh, and when you look at this title, The Library in the Life of the User, uh, we say that um, Lorcan Dempsey started talking about that last year. However, that's not a new terminology. Doug Zweizig, in the 1970s in his dissertation, talked about putting the library in the life of the user. And then Wayne Wiegand wrote an article about that in the 1990s, again bringing it up. So that brings me to the fact that we've been talking about it, but I'm not sure how much action we have taken in this area. And so basically, you know, it used to be that uh, we had the library, people came to us, uh, we said this is the way it is, we're not going to change anything, and now we need to be thinking about ways that we become more integrated into individuals' lives, because we are no longer the only place to get information. Um, and we never were, really. Uh, when I ask people, um, the world is my um, research arena. And when I talk to people just casually, uh, and they tell me how they get their information, very seldomly do they say the library. Uh, even if they do use the library, sometimes they don't even know it. And so at this point, we need to look at what individuals do and not what they say. Often people will tell us what we want them to hear. And so we have to ask questions differently and we have to observe. We should be asking a lot of why questions and not those questions, do you like this service? What do you think of the library? Um, another thing, uh, Doug Zweizig was one of my professors uh, at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. And one of the things he told us was uh, never just ask people, do you like something, whenever it has um, something to do with the library. And because they'll say yes, they don't want to hurt your feelings, and they don't want you to take something away from them, even if they don't use it. Okay, so it's like we store things. Um, I store food when I travel. I may never eat that food, but I may need that someday. Um, and so that's what we do with information or with services that we want. Convenience and context are very important because context it changes, as we know. And so what is convenient for me this moment may not be convenient for me an hour later. And so that's something that's very hard to determine. Uh, fragmentation is something that we hear a lot, uh, we, and we really need to promote services. And these are some quotes, I'm, I don't have time to stand here and read them to you, um, but you'll see that we don't market a lot of what we do, or we don't use the terminology that individuals would actually use or think of. And so uh, whenever you um, talk about uh, virtual reference services, uh, many people don't even know it exists. They don't know what virtual reference services are. Um, but if you say, oh, you can talk to or chat with a librarian at any time or text with a librarian, then that makes sense. So those are things that we need to really promote in language that people um, understand. We also learned a lot um, about satisficing. And that's a term that was um, uh, coined by uh, Her uh, Herb Simon at uh, Carnegie Mellon. And what it is is basically, you know, 
were saying, I'll take this, this is good enough, I'm going to use it. And what we found is that individuals weigh uh, the, the circumstances, the consequences. So students will say, oh, if this is only worth you know, 10 points of, of this entire semester for a grade, I'll take whatever. Whatever I get first, I don't care. Uh, and we do that in our lives. I mean, think about it. Uh, even with our personal information. One of the things we learned is that many individuals, especially those in their undergraduate uh, and high school years, are much more interested in finding authoritative information uh, about their personal lives than they are for their academic lives. That changes as they progress through their educational stages. But learning about med medical issues or something about my pet is more important to have accurate information often than for my academic work. Um, you know, Google and other search engines are very important as we know. I'm not telling you anything new. Um, what I am saying is let's be sure that we're searchable, accessible, we, they can discover us within these different search engines. And um, we hear a lot, you know, it's just, it, it, it's too complicated to find things on the website, um, on the library website. And so uh, we need to be thinking about the way things are displayed. Uh, people don't have a lot of patience. And I've heard a lot of graduate students say, yeah, I just can't figure out what I'm looking for when I go to the databases. And they use the term database. Uh, the high school students, the undergraduate students in their um, beginning years don't use those terms, but they talk about databases. So, so when we read the transcripts, we know that's what they're talking about, but they don't know our terminology. The graduate students say, I'm afraid I'm going to miss something. Why? Because they say they're often arranged by subjects, the journals or the databases. They're often in alphabetical order. I don't know what I want. And if I just pick one subject area and I'm interdisciplinary, I may miss something else. And so we need to think about the, the, well, the way we link this information and the way we display it. Um, another one, um, this is another quote, uh, again, it's how individuals, they, it, it's that whole idea of patience, um, going through information. Um, I was doing a, a focus group interview and a young woman said, you know, I go to an ATM, I put in a card, I put in a number and money comes out. I go to the library, I put in information and I don't know what comes out. And so that's something we need to think about, this instant gratification. What I put in, I want something to come out that makes sense. And I think this has a lot of implications for um, information literacy. And it's all about that, that teachable moment, that time of need. Uh, again, I want to just keep saying that um, this whole context, and this is, um, I like this, this is a 51-year-old uh, faculty member and he's in the theater department. And um, he keeps talking about this face-to-face -face and how he likes this face-to-face -face community. And I, I guess what I'm getting to here is that we have individuals who want different modes of, of interaction. They also want different modes uh, and formats for getting their information. And so in these days of the, you know, not having all the money we want in these economic times and the resources that we need, we really need to take data that we have and to try to determine um, how we should allocate our resources. And we're going to have to do a little bit of everything. I hate to say that. Or um, we need to collaborate and, and link to other services. Uh, we also learned that, that um, our users actually multitask. How many of us multitask? Yeah, probably most of us. Um, and they talk a lot about always being on, uh, on connected in some way with text, uh, with um, Facebook. What we heard was that I always have Facebook opened in the background, and this is what the undergraduate students and the high school students 
because I know somebody will be there from my class to help me with my assignment. So, so there'll be somebody there at all times. Now, these are not the groups that their tutors or their professors organized for them for their studies. These are groups that they've self-selected. They usually don't become a part of those other groups that were selected for them. So that's another thing that we need to think about. Have any of you read Sherry Turkle's new book? Um, well, she, uh, she's uh, at MIT. She's done a lot of really interesting work. And in her new book, she talks about the rule of three, which in libraries we know. I mean, when we were cataloging, um, you know, we always talked about the rule of three in fairy tales, you know, always three. And so she says whenever there are a group of um, individuals, and she's looking at high school undergraduate students, and they're sitting together, uh, they have a rule that if three people are in conversation, then the others who are sitting there with the group have permission to start texting or doing whatever they want. They don't have to pay attention because three people were already engaged. Now, we didn't know about, I, I didn't know about this rule of three, but as I travel or just in my everyday life, I watch individuals. And you'll see, I see families in hotels sitting at breakfast and not one person is looking at the other. Someone's reading a newspaper, somebody's on, the, on their tablet, uh, somebody's texting, but they may be texting each other. I don't know. Uh, so pay attention to your surroundings because this will help us understand a lot about how individuals communicate. Um, again, we need to really look at the personal context and relationship building. One of the uh, things that we have learned is in virtual reference services, if the individual feels that the librarian is respectful, uh, is it, you know, they'll, they'll say, hi, how are you? What's the weather like where you are today? And if the librarian says, hello, what do you need? Um, it just, it, it changes that whole communication, that whole interaction. If the librarian in engages, and even if the individual does not get the answer he or she wants, they will rate that as a successful encounter. So do not forget that. Uh, so it's all about um, the engagement, the relationship. Um, the screenagers, that 12 to 18 year old group, that, and this was coined by Rushkoff, um, they have some very traditional uh, views of librarians. I love this. It's like, it's like you, you don't want to go to the librarians. So what shelf are you pointing at? Because I mean, once they do their famous point, it's just like, I don't know what to do. So they're talking about, um, this is a, a, a high school student, and she said, I, when I asked the librarian, she does this point. And, and I'm, I'm afraid to ask her what she's pointing at. And it came out in some research the other day that um, individuals want the librarian to walk with them if they're in this face-to-face -face encounter and show them things. Faculty will say, I'm smart, but when I walk in the library, I become stupid. You make me feel stupid. Okay, and so we need to help them. Uh, uh, these are some other quotes. Um, they talk about never, this is um, a 19 year old, and he said um, he's never talked to a librarian before because he's not in the building much. And he didn't know that you could maybe communicate with a librarian in a virtual environment. Uh, and so one other thing is the environmental context, so our spaces and places. And we really need to change. And we can be a part of their um, social networks as well. So we need to be thinking about not only this uh, physical space, but also in this virtual space. And you know, we, we, we all know this. If you walk around your um, libraries, your institutions, you will see how people gather. Uh, you will see that you need some spaces for quiet and some spaces where they want to interact. Uh, I've walked in some libraries, even some public libraries, where they have um, balls and games and the families are sitting around tables playing. They have outdoor activities at these libraries. This is what we need to be thinking about. And this whole idea of an embedded librarianship, um, I 
uh, told the, the story yesterday of a librarian who had the privilege of enrolling in a class, um, and she was in the class for the entire semester with undergraduates. And then at the end of the semester, they were talking about which class they were taking the next semester. And she said, I, I, I won't be with you. And then she um, confessed, I'm a librarian. And she said that the students did not know that librarians knew what she knew. And um, so we really need to communicate and engage and become involved in the teaching and learning, whether it's face-to-face -face or online. Uh, I just like this quote. This is, again, um, this is a, a female, and this is a, a marketing professor, 51. It must be the age 51, although Prinsky, I'm, you know, I'm saying this isn't it. But um, she said she really missed that old-fashioned library. And when I told her it was still, the library was still there, you know, it's okay. And um, some of the faculty said when they talked about their dream uh, facility, library, it was having comfortable chairs, having coffee, having wine, having beer, having soft lighting, having their newspapers and journals around them. And so they have this very traditional view of, of learning. And you can find out um, a lot more in these reports. And so I'm uh, just pushing that a little bit. And the other thing that we, um, I want you to think about is that individuals think that, that libraries equal books. And that's something, again, I think that goes back to our marketing. They don't even know what services we have. Uh, we need to know our communities. Uh, we need to be engaged with them. We need to make relationships. And believe me, don't put someone who's not good in face-to-face -face reference services in an online environment because they may not be good in the online environment either. So be careful uh, and be sure that you have people who, who want to engage with individuals. And we have something, it's a, a GISC guide. It, this um, research for digital visitors and residents was funded by GISC, Oxford University, OCLC, and in partnership with the University of North Carolina, Charlotte. And in, at, on this guide online, you can get information. Uh, we have all of our surveys, our survey questions out there, our interview questions. We have um, descriptions of when to use observations, diaries. So we have a lot of information out there. You don't need to reinvent everything. You can borrow, you can use, we make that available. Um, I'm also going to um, plug the, I have a new research methods book coming out with Marie Radford. There's a lot of information in there where we give examples. And I, I go back to Ranganathan, uh, that one report, and he says the library is a, is a growing organism. And he also said, um, follow the user, um, follow the reader from the moment he or she enters the library until he or she leaves the library. And that's what we need to be doing in both the virtual and in that physical space. And so I'll leave you with this, use what you know, learn what you don't know, and, in, and learn to engage in, in new ways. Thank you.